I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your word now asking for help to be soft-hearted before you, to have our eyes open, our ears ready. We depend on your voice. We have it in your word. And may it be our daily bread, the food of our souls. May we be encouraged by examples, compelled by your commands, strengthened by your encouragements, held fast by your promises. In a shifting world uh, with unpredictable people and an uncertain future, we have an anchor in your word. Guarantees of what is to come and hope for today. We ask that you would help us in this hour for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Full confession, uh, when I came up earlier to lead us in a communion meditation, this uh, microphone that I'm wearing didn't work. I asked to use the pulpit microphone, and all of you thought, oh, somebody blew it in the booth back there. It was me. I just didn't turn on my microphone. (laughs) And you need to know something about the crew back there. Daniel Jackson uh, and his team uh, would just absolutely despise me saying anything about them because their whole goal has been to be invisible uh, and to serve us, and they have served us so well in ways really nobody knows but the Lord. Uh, Some of us who are around the campus throughout the week are aware of the tireless hours, the late nights, the early mornings, uh, the labor on campus and off campus just to make this experience here be unnoticed, (laughs) undistracting, helpful for the proclamation of God's word, for our singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another on Sunday mornings. It really is remarkable. Uh, a service of love, no doubt, for their Savior and for all of you. Uh, You just need to know that you are loved by the booth back there in ways we'll really not grasp in this life. So um, I hate to heap aspersions on them by saying, which mic should I use? That one was my fault. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. And we're going to look this morning at verses 22 to 29 titled this message this morning, Travel Plans. We get a window into what Paul anticipates he will be doing as he's writing this letter. No doubt you have made travel plans. Perhaps you are a detail planner where you boil down your itinerary to every minute and you've labeled every activity, everything that shall be eaten at every moment of your travel. Maybe you're a loosey-goose planner. We're going to go somewhere and whatever happens is what happens. No matter where you are on the spectrum of travel planning, no doubt you've experienced travels that have not gone the way that you've thought, anticipated, or planned. My wife and I had a 20th anniversary trip planned uh, this year. 2020 is an interesting time to travel. Uh, We had a direct flight from Phoenix to London. That's nice. That's really technologically incredible, except our airplane had a windshield wiper that was not suited to London Heathrow Airport's expectations about windshield wipers, and so we spent an extra day, a couple extra days, and a couple extra cities we didn't plan, Uh, fewer hours than we anticipated to sleep and to do activities. And then while we were on our trip, there were travel bans from Europe, and we wondered, would we get back? We skipped a trip to Geneva to see a church planning friend there, and we made efforts to come back here. We had a great time, but it did not go the way that we had planned. We had a road trip a couple of years back, and we made plans to stay with friends in various places. One of our stops was Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and we had brought our tent and our camping gear And we hadn't yet gone to sleep, and the tent was filled with water, and the sleeping bags were soaked. We spent the night in a Motel 6, (laughs) and we thought, Coeur d'Alene is terrible. On the way back, we stopped again in Coeur d'Alene and had the time of our lives. It's hard to tell what's going to happen when you make your plans. 
For Paul the Apostle, he has detailed for the Roman believers at the end of this letter what he plans to do, where he plans to go, and why he plans to do the things that he does. And we get to see a window into the heart of the Apostle Paul. What is driving him? What compels him to go from place to place? And we may get a window into how those plans turned out. Paul lays out his gospel travel itinerary in this passage. We're going to look at that in sort of four stages. He wanted to get to Rome. That is the first thing we need to look at. That's in verse 22 and 23. Let's read the whole text first, and then we'll zoom in on these stages. Paul says, Romans 15, beginning in verse 22, For this reason I have often been prevented from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, Whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing, and to be helped on my way there by you, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while, but now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister them also in material things." Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. The first phase of Paul's intended journeys from this point is just the expression that he has wanted to come and see the believers at Rome. This has been a long-standing desire of the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 22, I have often been prevented from coming to you, but now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you. And tragically, in English, this is an incomplete sentence. It accurately represents the Greek text, which is also an incomplete sentence. (laughs) Paul breaks, breaks off his thought here and moves on to other things. But what we get in verses 22 and 23 are an indication of Paul's heartfelt desire to see the Roman believers. And this reflects what he already indicated in chapter 1. He longs to see them to impart some spiritual gift. That is, by mutual encouragement, they would be blessed by each other's presence. Paul wants to get to Rome. And he's been hindered, he says here. He's been hindered. I have often been prevented from coming to you, he says in verse 22. What is Paul referring to here? I believe he's referring to the previous verses we looked at last week. He has been hindered by gospel labor. From Jerusalem roundabout to Illyricum, he has been busy with gospel work. He has been indefatigable. He has been relentless. He has been tireless in his pursuit of taking the gospel to Gentiles place after place after place, preaching the gospel, establishing churches, encouraging churches, setting up leadership in various churches. There are times where Paul says he was hindered by Satan, other times where he was hindered by the Holy Spirit. Here what he is indicating is the labor of establishing churches in pioneer missionary work from Jerusalem roundabout to Illyricum has kept him from getting to Rome yet. And he wants to get there. Now that work is done, look what he says in verse 23, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and this is what we talked about last week, it's not as if Paul faithfully saw everyone from Jerusalem to Illyricum come to Christ, but his task of pioneering missionary work, that is establishing churches which will infiltrate those regions with the gospel, that work was done in all of those regions leading up to Paul being in Spain. And he says he has wanted for years to see them. And then he breaks off that sentence and that leads us to verse 24. This is the second stage of Paul's gospel travel itinerary. He says he desires to be sent to Spain. Look at verse 24. Whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you, When I have first enjoyed your company for a while. 
And just notice from that verse, Paul just got done saying how much he longs to see the Roman believers, how he wants to be mutually encouraged by them, chapter 1, and now he says, and I'm just going to pass through. I really want to see you on my way to Spain. For the Apostle Paul, Rome is not the destination, but preaching Christ where he has not yet been named. That is his heart's desire. And so he lets them know he is on his way to Spain. He wants to see them in passing. And more than that, he says he wants to be sent by them. He wants to be helped along by them. And the word that Paul uses here when he says to be helped on the way is a word that means to be sent, but fundamentally to be accompanied in that journey. And and by extension here in this verse, Paul is anticipating being helped on his way by the Roman believers to regions beyond. This makes the letter to the Romans a missionary support letter. Paul is letting them know that he is going to be in Rome and he wants to be helped by the Roman believers on his way beyond Rome. He is likely asking here for monetary help, for logistical provision, for prayer and timely encouragement. And if we take the basic meaning of the word to accompany, uh, like it was used in Acts 20, 38, that the Ephesian elders accompanied Paul to the ship, that it is very likely he is putting out feelers even here that personnel, that people from Rome would help him in his further gospel endeavors to Spain. It's likely that Paul would need help with language in foreign lands. It's likely that Paul would need help in knowing how to get around. And there may be some in Rome that could help him along his way. This gets to the reason that Paul has written this letter. The the letter to the Romans is a thorough, clear, deep, rich articulation of the gospel. Clearer, longer, deeper, and more thorough than any other place in Paul's writings. This is why Martin Luther has said that the letter to the Romans is the purest gospel. It is an absolutely front end to back end clear demonstration of how sinners are made right before a holy God. How God gets to keep his reputation as just and righteous and still forgive sinners. It is a remarkable exposition of substitutionary atonement and faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says in chapter 1 that he was eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. He sends them this letter which articulates the gospel and he still wants to preach the gospel to them. And he acknowledges many believers who themselves have been preachers and proclaimers of the gospel and believers of the gospel who were already at Rome. Why should believers who know the gospel and church leaders who proclaim the gospel need a letter articulating the gospel and then for Paul to be present and preach the gospel to them? For mutual encouragement, he says in chapter 1. But I think even more than that because gospel clarity produces gospel compulsion. Clear gospel articulation puts in front of believers gospel responsibility. And if Paul's aim in writing this letter with such a very clear articulation of the gospel is to encourage Roman believers to participate with him in gospel ministry. If week after week after week you hear the glorious reality of Christ having taken on flesh and come to the earth and die in the place of sinners in order to save them from God's wrath. And you revel in that because you personally have experienced new life in Messiah Jesus. And we rehearse these things for one another over and over again. You cannot leave this place without thinking of the people out there who don't yet have the gospel. You can't help thinking of the entire regions and people groups and linguistic groupings of people all across the world who have never yet heard of this gospel. 
And so rehearsing gospel truth becomes fuel for gospel responsibility. Paul is writing this letter to encourage the Roman believers to think ahead. Hey, when I get there, I want you to send me with everything that I need to accomplish the task to regions where the gospel hasn't gone yet. And so in this letter, let's just lay the gospel out. Let's just revel in its glories thoroughly, deeply. Gospel clarity will produce gospel compulsion, gospel responsibility, gospel obligation. And Paul says at the end of the verse 24, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. And while Rome is a waypoint on the way to where Paul wants to get, he relishes the opportunity to enjoy the Roman believers' fellowship, their company their participation in the gospel. The third phase of Paul's plans, his gospel travel itinerary, is found in verses 25 to 27. Paul says he is headed to Jerusalem. Hey, I've finished gospel proclamation and pioneering church planting and evangelistic work from Jerusalem all the way round about the eastern Mediterranean to Illyricum, which gets me almost to Rome... So I'm almost there, Roman believers, but I'm headed to Jerusalem. I'm headed to Jerusalem. He says, but now, verse 25, I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister them also in material things. Paul says he is headed to Jerusalem. He is on an errand, taking a contribution of monetary gifts from Gentile churches back to poor saints in Jerusalem. He says that Macedonia and Achaia have given to the poor Christians in Jerusalem. There had been a famine in Jerusalem in the late 40s. It's likely that many Jewish Christians were impoverished because of growing hostility towards Christianity. It was increasingly difficult for someone to be a Jew and a follower of Messiah, whom official Judaism had repudiated as a fraud, a criminal, and cursed by God. This meant the division of families. It potentially meant the loss of jobs and property. And without the protection of being under Judaism, the sect of Christianity began to lose its favored status under Roman rule of protection from persecution for being what the Romans called atheists. If you don't believe in the Roman and Greek pantheon of deities, if you don't participate in emperor worship, the emperor is God on earth and savior of the world, etc. If you don't believe those things, we're calling you an atheist. The only exception is Judaism, because we don't want to revolt. We want to keep the peace. Well, if Christians, Jewish Christians, were no longer considered Jews, then they were out from under the protection of the exception. All of this lends to the very real possibility that many Christians in Jerusalem faced adverse financial circumstances. And Paul says he's headed there to serve the saints, the word where we get deacon. He is going to do ministry there. The churches referenced here by Macedonia and Achaia would be the churches of Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and Corinth. Again, Paul is writing from Corinth. And they have participated in this contribution, verse 26. Contribution here is the word koinonia or just fellowship. It is the commonality of family life together for brothers and sisters in Christ, even though separated by significant geography. And to talk about a contribution here in terms of this fellowship, this sweet, warm fellowship, it means that meeting needs was an expression of Christian togetherness. Meeting the physical needs was a demonstration of solidarity and a uniting of Christians in this task of walking a pilgrim life on earth together. And Paul says they were pleased to give this contribution. Twice he says it in verse 26 and 27. 
And he goes on and says they were indebted to this contribution. Why would Gentile churches be indebted to meet the needs of Jewish Christians in Jerusalem? Notice what Paul says in verse 27. Gentiles have shared, and here is that koinonia word again in verb form. They have fellowshiped in Jewish spiritual blessings. Gentiles have fellowshiped in Jewish spiritual blessings. And if you were a Gentile in the first century, and especially if you had just read this letter to the Romans, and, and if you had just read Romans 9 to 11, you would remember that it's an amazing thing that a Gentile gets to participate in promises made to Israel and benefit spiritually from Israel's Messiah. Grafted in contrary to nature into the rich root of the olive tree that belonged to the fathers, the patriarchs, the promises of God and the very oracles of God entrusted to the nation of Israel. And we Gentile outsiders get to participate so that we Gentiles in this thing, the, the people of God, now the church of God, Jew and Gentile together in one body, one new man, ought to be saying, what am I doing here? I was a wild olive tree, uncultivated. I have no business being part of this thing called the mercy of God. And yet I get to participate in these rich realities that properly belonged to the nation of Israel. What a remarkable thing. And these Gentile churches felt this. They, they were not obligated in some sort of legal sense. This is not a, a tax levied against Gentile churches to bring about equality. This is a free will offering, a contribution given cheerfully by Gentiles who recognize my Jewish brothers are in need. Right? There was a time early in the church's history where Jews actually cared for Gentile widows in Jerusalem. And now on a much grander scale, Gentiles are seeing the needs of the impoverished Jews in Jerusalem and saying, oh, we owe so much. In fact, what monetary reimbursement could possibly take care of the debt of gratitude we have for the spiritual realities of being in Messiah together with Jews? No price is too high for that. And so they were pleased they were obligated, they were indebted in a spiritual sense, and so they had fellowshiped with Jews in spiritual blessings. Now they will serve them, literally minister to them, in physical blessings, meeting physical needs. No financial contribution could ever outweigh the benefits of the spiritual good they received. And so this is good and appropriate. They were willing to meet this need. And it's not just a meeting of a physical need here, but a solidarity with God's people. Gentiles giving to Jews in Jerusalem presents a unity that the gospel only could produce in an era of racial or ethnic strife. They loved these people, many of whom had not met each other, and yet there is a fondness and an affection for them. And you can think about how important this would be to Paul. A Hebrew of Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees, rocked by the grace of God in Christ. Then made apostle to the Gentiles, but everywhere he went, starting in the synagogues, preaching Christ to the Jews who were there, for the gospel was to the Jew first and then the Gentile. Paul even writing this letter to the Romans to help and encourage and perhaps improve Jew and Gentile relationships in the church at Rome. Paul, having been sent by the Jerusalem apostles, commissioned specifically as the apostle to the Gentiles, those apostles recognizing what God was doing through Paul and through his companions. For Paul to come back to Jerusalem with monetary resources in hand from places like Philippi, and Berea, and Thessalonica, and Corinth. To be able to report to them, look what the gospel has done. You sent us out to the Gentiles, and look what's coming back. This monetary remuneration is fruit of Gentile conversion. Not just Gentile conversion, but Gentile physical blessing as an expression of love to Jewish roots. 
This could only bring about joy in Paul's heart, having been sent and having seen fruit, tangible fruit of Gentile repentance. I haven't gone out for nothing. And to come back home, to come back to Jerusalem and to the Jews there with this fruit is remarkable. 2 Corinthians 8, Paul says to the Corinthian believers, he had appealed to them in 1 Corinthians about the collection. He said, take it up weekly, which meant they were, the Corinthian believers were going to give intentionally, regularly, sacrificially, and cheerfully. And in 2 Corinthians 8, he makes reference to this. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. And the example of the believers in Achaia and in Macedonia Uh, Paul used to lay before the Corinthian believers in their own intentional, cheerful, and methodical giving to meet this need. Paul lays out the last phase of his plans in verses 28 to 29. He always wanted to go to Rome. He had been prevented from getting there. Uh, He wants to go through Rome to Spain, but first he's going to Jerusalem on this errand. But then he will pass through Rome. Phase four here, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, when I have finished this, and I have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. He says, I will pass through you to Spain, having finished the Jerusalem errand and having sealed this fruit of theirs. Uh, This is something of an odd phrase for Paul to seal the fruit of the Gentile contribution. Uh, It has the idea of an official stamp of approval over some activity. Paul's personal delivery of this financial contribution as apostle to the Gentiles, an expression of Gentile love and appreciation for the Jews, of solidarity, unity in the gospel, of a demonstration of the fruitfulness of gospel expansion, all of this was important to Paul, and it was why he wanted to deliver it personally, to bring this contribution firsthand to Jerusalem. And he says, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Paul's plan is not to come and make a permanent home in Rome. For him, Rome is not a destination but a waypoint. Paul's desire to be there is not to see the magnificent city. His heartbeat is not to chop it up with the intellectual elite. He is not a tourist nor a travel blogger. But his heart's desire is to enjoy the camaraderie and the gospel, to encourage, to receive encouragement to be provisioned for further gospel expansion. How did it go? How did Paul's travel itinerary work out? Actually, he got to do the things that he described. And yet the details of this itinerary worked out, no doubt, in ways that surprised the Apostle Paul. In fact, when Paul finally walked into Rome, he was virtually alone and he was in custody. That may not have been what he intended when he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, run this errand, and then I'm going to come back to Rome, and then I'm going to go on to Spain. We get some of these details in the book of Acts. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 20. And we'll just kind of parachute into some of the narrative of Acts and pick up some of these events. In Acts 20, he is meeting with the Ephesian elders. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he says in verse 22, Behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, 
except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul's just driven by gospel desire here, by gospel expansion. And when he gets wind that this will include afflictions, he says, I'm not important. I don't have a high view of myself. I just want to finish the task that God has given me. Pretty remarkable perspective that feeds into the purpose he has for his own life. Look at chapter 21, beginning in verse 27. Here Paul is in Jerusalem, he's at the temple, and Luke writes, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid, this is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people, against the law, and against this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him. They supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked. The people rushed together and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple and immediately the doors were shut. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the Roman commander of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. At once he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up and took hold of him, ordered him to be bound with two chains, and began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing, some another. And when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. The multitude of the people kept following, shouting, away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? And the commander had assumed that he was a rebel rouser, perhaps an Egyptian or Aramean. And Paul addresses the crowd. A pretty remarkable scene Paul tells the angry mob who he is and what he is all about. It only, in the end, brings him more trouble. Acts 23, look at verse 9. In the midst of an uproar, Paul creates a distracting uproar. Right? Sadducees and Pharisees made up the council. Paul drove a theological wedge between them, (laughs) sort of a distraction. He said, I'm on trial because of the resurrection of the dead. Pharisees believe in resurrection, Sadducees didn't. They start arguing with each other. Look at verse 9. There occurred a great uproar. Some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up, began to argue, we find nothing wrong with this man. (laughs) Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, and a great dissension was developing. The commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Look at verse 11. But on the night immediately following, could you imagine what Paul is thinking at this point? And God gives him immediate comfort. The Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. And there Paul's desire intersects with a direct promise from the Lord Jesus. You will go to Rome. How does Paul get there? Uh, In 23, 12 and following, there is a conspiracy to kill Paul. Could you imagine what it would be like if 40 people or more got together and said, I'm not eating anything until Paul's dead. Paul's nephew overhears of the plot, tells the... Roman soldier, the Roman soldier makes provision for Paul. He's rescued, verse 23 and following, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen, and Paul on a horse. 
untouchable by 40 starving guys. <laughs> Paul's going to get to Rome. And first he's taken to Felix, the governor. Look at chapter 24, verse 17. After several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But then there were Jews from Asia who they should have been present before you to make accusation if they should have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council, other than for this one statement which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead I'm on trial before you. But Felix, having a much more exact knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. Think about that. Paul might long for justice, equitable treatment, appropriate Roman jurisprudence, and his case just gets tabled. <laughs> He's not tried. Uh, th there's no evidence. Let him go. Uh, he's still in custody. Uh, look at the end of chapter 24. Uh, you, you, you get the report that Felix was sort of entertained by Paul and was maybe looking for a bribe. After two years, verse 27... Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul imprisoned. There's no reason to keep Paul in custody. He hasn't done anything criminal. It's the other guys who are making the rebel-rousing, riotous mobs happen. Pax Romana, or the peace of Rome, was not threatened by Paul. It was threatened by Paul's detractors. And yet, for a political favor, Felix leaves him languishing. Can you imagine what you would be thinking? Well, this isn't right. Where's my lawyer? And then look what happens. Festus then, having arrived in the province three days later, went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Uh, Paul comes to the fore. It's probably another two months where Paul is still imprisoned before he gets a chance to bring anything before Portius Festus. In Acts 25, verse 11, still with no evidence, nothing to incriminate Paul on, Paul appeals to Caesar. Verse 11, If then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if none of these things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Uh, the law kicks in, and Paul has to go to Rome. Probably not the way he planned. On foot, by sailing vessel. No, he's still in custody. On the way, Paul gives a defense in Acts 26 before King Herod Agrippa II. In Acts 27, there is a shipwreck, and he's left for three months on the island of Malta. He's snake-bitten. And he heals a ruler's son. Then there's another ship. Go to chapter 28. Another voyage. Verse 11 of Acts 28. At the end of the three months, we set sail on, on an Alexandrian ship, which had wintered on the island. We put it at Syracuse, stayed there for three days. Verse 13, we sailed around Regium. A day later, a south wind sprang up. On the second day, we came to Puteoli. We found some brethren. We were invited to stay with them seven days. And thus we came to Rome. And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Appius and three inns to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who was guarding him. After three days, Paul called together to himself the leading men of the Jews. When Paul gets to Rome, he calls together the Jews of the city and begins to preach to them the gospel of Messiah Jesus. And Paul spends the rest of his earthly ministry, not in missionary journeys, but in various confinements and imprisonments. Paul's Christian life was one of preparation for ministry, 
and then the expansion of gospel proclamation through his missionary enterprises, and then jail terms. Sporadically interposed with some more missionary endeavor. It does seem likely, by the way, from the witness outside the Bible, a letter called First Clement, that Paul did make it to Spain on a missionary journey before another Roman imprisonment and his eventual martyrdom under Nero. Paul's life was a life of gospel ministry. And as he made plans for his life, what did he have in view? Follow Christ. Know Christ. That is of surpassing value to everything to which it could be compared and to make him known. A remarkable life, a remarkable ministry. Paul's plans did not go the way he had imagined. He could not have detailed all of the events that would transpire. But what do we learn in his life and his ministry and even through his desires and the Lord's leading this apostle to the Gentiles? Consumed with Christ, consumed with love for Christ's church, he would spend himself and be expended for God's glory and the expansion of the gospel. He's a remarkable model and example for us. None of us will be apostles. None of us will have the gifts. None of us will have the experiences in total that Paul had. And yet he has blazed a trail that the church would follow for as long as the church is on the earth to greater and lesser successes. Let's pray. Lord, we give you praise for raising up this Jew, Saul of Tarsus, whom you humbled and forgave, and then set on this task of taking the gospel to the likes of us, Gentiles, outsiders, unnatural olive trees grafted into the natural branch, given promises and provision in Messiah Jesus, given eternal life and a relationship to you. We thank you for his example God, we pray that the heartbeat that the Apostle Paul had to design his life, to organize his thoughts and his plans around gospel expansion, we pray that that would rub off on us, that that would be contagious, and that we would aim, direct our lives toward these same goals. We ask it in Jesus' name.